Okay, good afternoon. How's everybody? Good. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank Strauman for inviting me to participate on this CORP reform at the Europario. And thank all of you to being here today, as well as thank everybody that is potentially watching on Facebook uh, during this hour, especially during uh, World Cup. So my topic today is going to be immediate full arch restoration using the Strauman Pro Arch treatment approach. The presentation objectives will be to review some clinical factors that may influence the treatment planning in immediate rehabilitation of fully edentulous patients with a fixed restoration, presenting uh, details regarding the digital workflow, discussing surgical aspects related to the fixed rehabilitation of edentulous patients, emphasizing the patient-centered and restoratively driven approach uh, for fully edentulous patients with the Strauman ProArch approach. So what is the Strauman ProArch? Strauman ProArch is a combination of factors that go all the way from treatment planning to bone decision making on choosing the surgical components, decision making on choosing the prosthetic components, custom milled framework, and then finally the final restoration is delivered. So Monday you're back in your office and you have this patient, fully edentulous patient, walking into your office, no health issues, no money problems. What would you do? What are your treatment choices? How do you work up the case to deliver to this patient a fixed rehabilitation? So you have all the data, you have all the indications. Then we talk about what are the treatment decisions. Do you use four or do you use six implants or use more? Do you graft or do you do graftless indication? Do you do parallel or do you do tilted implants? Do you do parallel or tapered implants? Do you do long or do you use short implants? Do you do immediate or conventional loading? A one piece or a segmented restoration? You see how many options we have, but the beauty is that we have all those options available in the ProArch way of thinking because we can analyze the patient and decide during the workflow what is the best situation for our patient. And that is the main theme of my presentation because it doesn't matter if the patient is losing all his teeth, has a lot of bone, is already completely dangerous, or is a big maxillomandibular atrophy. The patients, they do not want implants. The patients want teeth. They want teeth to implant supported restorations. They want teeth with minimal problems, with minimal future complications, with a good cost-benefit ratio. Like Frank said in the beginning of the introduction, they want everything fast and cheap. And that combination, good, fast, and cheap, maybe not, never happen. See, so there is always a compromise in one side. And what we need to know is that a treatment plan starts with the final restoration as a goal. We need to have realistic expectations regarding the surgery, regarding the final result, the risks, and the long-term maintenance. And that is really important. We are uh, one of the main periodontology congresses in the world, and maintenance is really, really, really important, sometimes overlooked on fully dangerous patients. So the treatment of completely dangerous patients, according to the SAC classification of the ITI, is considered advanced to complex. It's not for beginners. So if you've never done a fully edentulous case, you have to rely on somebody to guide you, to assist you, to learn how you work up the case. The surgical and restorative difficulties are there, are present, and we have to have experience on handling these complications or potential complications. So when we think about surgical possibilities, looking at this panoramic, we see four, six, six, eight completely different distributed implants, but we have to think about restorative outcomes. What kind of prosthesis can we support with, those, with that distribution of that configuration of implant placement? And especially in the maxill, we also have to look at the palatal portion and the transverse portion. That's really important for delivering the final restoration. So our possible options will be no implants, like conventional denture, an over-denture. We are not talking about removable today. It's only about fixed bridge going anywhere from four to eight implants, maybe even three in the manual, with a complete a one-piece restoration or a segmented bridge with normal teeth, long teeth, or a big flange like a hybrid. And we have to understand that we may be able to use two restorative concepts, being very simplistic. One will be the ideal restorative view. What we have to do is think about alveolar reconstruction, giving the patient a natural lip support, distribute and use the number of implants that is in theory ideal, parallel implants, no cantilever, segmented restorations, easier cleaning, easier maintenance, easier to manufacture. 
but sometimes that means we have to do a graft for the patient. And a graft is invasive, is co it costs mo more money, it takes a longer time for this patient to have a final restoration. Like this case, we grafted, we placed eight implants, and we have a four, three unit bridges, uh, fixed bridges for this patient. So 12 teeth in eight implants and four segmented bridges. It's not a full arch. It, it is a full arch, but it's not a one piece. Or the other concept will be bone anchorage. Bone anchorage means we place the number and distribution of the implants according to the available bone. It's less invasive, it takes less time, we may do immediate loading, and that is a trend right now. It's a graftless procedure where we tilt or we use short or we try to place the implants and distribute it as well as possible in order to have a best anchorage. That's why it's really important to have a full diagnostic setup. The diagnostic setup is one of the most important things because we see nowadays all the digital workflow, everybody's going digital. My 13-year-old kid can play with digital stuff better than I can, but he doesn't know an an anything about surgery or dentures. So you have to be a fully understand about full dentures, a prosthodontist, to design the denture and then go back into placing the implant. So clinical examination, data collection through articulated study models, face, intraoral photos, then you do a diagnostic setup. Only then we construct a tomographic guide. We do a dual scan. We get CBCT, and then we have an appointment with the team first to discuss the options, and then with the patient. So, basically, this is my current surgical team, and I'm lucky to work with a lot of excellent prosthodontists in Brazil and then in the United States. Now, is the assessment of five basic parameters: one, incisal edge position, position of the central incisors, harmonious teeth relationship the plane of occlusion, define that as well, facial tissue support and available prosthetic space. I don't have time to address all of those, so let's look a little bit of each detail important. Determine where the teeth need to be. So that's an inverted occlusal plane relationship. Look at that smile line in relation to this transition zone. It's a problem, so we have to analyze the facial support and determine where the ne teeth need to be in relation to the face. So aesthetically correct tooth positioning and the need for leaf support. Then facial tissue support and function is given through an analysis of the teeth position and the need or not need for a flange. So this is the patient profile and intraoral view without any teeth or any uh, flange. This, this is just the teeth with no flange, and this will be here, the teeth with the flange. We take photos, we show to the patient. What do you think? You see, oh, I like this uh, option better. Okay, so then we have to either do you a removable denture or we have to graft. Because if we do this, large flange as a fixed restoration, we will not be able to clean. It's bad maintenance, it's bad problem, a lot of problems for the patient. So diagnostics, imaging, planning, communication, and surgical, that's really important with what we call multifunctional guide. That can be done through frontal photos as well. We can analyze the transverse position because sometimes we do place an implant right on the center of the uh, dentulous ridge on a posterior mandibular maxilla, and that's still lingual or palatal to the buccal surface of the tooth. That means we have a lateral cantilever or we have a large space for the patient to clean and they cannot uh, clean. Facial tissue support is really important. That's for me the basic definition between fix or removal. So if you put uh, implants on this maxilla, we have to do a bar over denture because you know, what is the discrepancy from the lower teeth? There is no way we can do fixed restoration with this kind of discrepancy. So if the patient really demands a fixed restoration, that's the case for a graft, maybe a lift for one advancement osteotomy in order to get the correct facial support, the correct uh, maxillum and liver relationship, and then finally del deliver the restoration. Otherwise, it has to be removed. And prosthetic space, really important as a maxillofacial surgeon. More and more I learn about prosthetic space. The anatomic structures, the vertical dimension of occlusion, they dictate the vertical space, the vertical prosthetic space. What is the minimum vertical prosthetic space? Well, minimum is four to seven millimeters for abutment and coping height, plus a couple millimeters or three for framework, depending on what kind of framework, plus the veneering material. That takes us to s uh, anywhere from minimum of seven to maximum of 12 millimeters. If we look at models in relationship with models, that's also good for communication with the patients. Seven to 12 millimeters for a fixed. If we use a hybrid or a lot of pink part, then we can have larger than 12, or if it's even more, we have to have a removable denture. Now, this nice paper written by Adrian Polini with uh, Dr. Morton and, and uh, Ricardo Mitrani uh, talks, uh, talks about the key relationships between lips, teeth, and the residual ridge. 
as clinicians, we have to understand that the residual ridge can be modified by the clinical team in order to provide the ideal tooth position, the ideal lip and the ideal uh, residual ridge uh, uh, relationship. So let's say a patient comes with a removable prosthesis and wants to have it fixed, we may ne we need to do an augmentation may have to do a small horizontal augmentation or even a small uh, a vertical and horizontal augmentation if you want to do a fixed. Now, if you want to go on the way back, then that's a, a augmentation for the maxilla to bring it to a fixed restoration. If we want to do a removal or if the patient lip line is high and the transition zone between the hybrid or the pink flange is showing, we have to remove bone, we have to do an alveoloplasty, we have to create vertical space. Because I have seen cases where the implants are perfectly positioned in a lot of bone, and then they get referred to the prosthodontist, and they cannot restore it. There is no space. The transition zone is showing pink with natural tissue. That's not a good treatment. So we have to do alveoloplasties or go with the removal. So the decision to remove good bone is very difficult because we have to do it in some cases. I don't like to do it, but in some, some cases we do have to do it, especially if patients cannot afford a fully fixed restoration. We have to do removal. We have to remove some bone in cases like we're, we're seeing here. Now, digital planning. How does that help us? We're we then we have the relationship of teeth with the bone, and we look at where should the future teeth be? Where is the available bone? Is it possible to place implants in a favorable 3D position? Is there a need for a graft? Can we do a graft? How big of a graft we have to do? Then we look at surgical alternatives from less complicated to more complicated graftless, graftless solution, immediate implants, reduced diameter implants in the anterior, kilter versus angled, short in the posterior, maybe minor simultaneous graft solutions with GBR or transalveolar sinus floor elevations. They're all good combinations in a fully dentist because basically we will splint all the implants. So that helps our long-term relation, long-term success rates on this kind of implants. Now, if we go to more invasive, we can do moderate staged graft solutions, bilateral sinus floor augmentations, extensive bone reconstructions like extra oral bone, iliac rest, orthognathic surgery. That's for only a little, little, little bit of number of patients that we treat nowadays. And that is basically dictated by anatomy. The zones of the maxilla or the mandible, the presence of absence of the zones dictate the surgical concept. Can we distribute the implants adequately in order to reduce cantilever? Can we have good lip support? How many implants do I need? Those are all questions that are being now discussed uh, in, in a lot of uh, different meetings. So we look at these three different classifications, Brennemark, Kewin and Howard, Bedrosian, and that's how we see uh, uh, the zones of the maxilla. Kia Pasco did a great paper showing that the lower success rates is that what we found with more severe atrophies. Of course, if you have a case that we will treat like multiple uh, uh, single teeth and splint to do a fully fixed denture, is different than a really big maxillary at atrophy, for instance. This is a recent classification by Professor Carmes from Portugal. He uh, just analyzed a lot of uh, radiographs and then he came with a nice classification Carmen's classification one, when we have a lot of bone, we can place anywhere from four to six implants, all the way to major maxillary resorption. Uh, Carmen's classification number five, where we have to tilt or do a small graft, and that can also be applied for the mandible. So again, anatomy dictating position and distribution of the implants, always in relation to the future teeth, and that's the important point. Cantilever, cantilever considerations, the AP spread, it's not only about the number of implants. If you ask me, I don't like the six implants well positioned too anteriorly. Sometimes it's better to have only four as long as they are better distributed. So that's a key important thing. It's not about the number, it's about the distribution of implants. So these six here on are much better than those six over there because they're better distributed. Now, when we look at bone and we search for immediate loading, we also have to talk about torque. How do we achieve? good primary stability. So one thing is know your system. If you're using parallel wall implant, know how to achieve primary stability with that. If you're using a tapered wall, uh, a tapered wall implant, know how to achieve primary stability with that implant. For the bone level tapered, which is our favorite uh, implant for that kind of indication, I like it because we have a flexible surgical procedure. Sometimes we even achieve 35 Newton centimeters before putting the implant in the correct vertical position. We have to unscrew it, we have to taper it down and then put it back in. We don't want to over torque. So one of the key things, recognize the kind of bone you have and then you have to drill or under drill. 
Like sometimes in very soft bone, you want to get up to the 2.8 millimeter drill and go straight to the 4.1 millimeter implant. That will give you very high primary stability. And then you can apply immediate loading. Remember, those patients are fully adventurous. They don't want to go home without any teeth in most of the situations, right? So we have to understand how to work with the system to achieve primary stability. Primary stability can be measured today in a variety of ways. Insertion torque, that's more common, and we have to achieve anywhere from 35 to 45 newton centimeters as a guideline. Uh, the ISQ measured by Ostel is also a nice one today. It just they just launched that this meeting uh, uh, the, the latest model of the ISQ measurement with Ostel, and then of course subjective opinion of the surgeon. I had good primary stability, but that of course is not a measurable uh, number. So I'm going to show you a couple cases before we finish. This is a case, an old case. We did the extraction, treated every socket as a as an immediate implant placement in the static zone. Six parallel tissue level implants, very good tissue level implants, very stable. And then in the right side of the patient, we did a simultaneous transalveolar sinus floor elevation. Uh, we did extraction, minimally invasive extraction, just like Professor uh, Lambert showed to you. And then we had the multifunctional guide. That guide was used not only to guide me to put the implants in the right position, but still with the palatal present here, we use it to stabilize and we use it to put the implants in the right spots. And then we use that guide to have the immediate abutment secured with uh, resin. And then while I was finishing the graft, the lab was finishing the denture. And then finally we went and we screwed. This is immediate, same day, done with the patient because there was a lot of lab preparation, handmade. And this is at the time of the uh, final restoration, three months after the placement. So this is the final two-piece uh, ceramic. Each, each half side here is supported by three implants. And we have a seven-year follow-up here. Seven-year follow-up, very good tissue stability around the neck of the implants, as you can see there. Very nice soft tissue, because if it works for an aesthetic zone, why shouldn't it work for multiple implants in the aesthetic zone to hold the fully dentured? So we don't have to remove bone and do hybrid in all the cases if we have all the good positions. We have good lay position, we have good soft tissue, so that's really important. Now, what are the challenges with chair side conversions? We may need to over prepare. We may have to have a lot of different components available. So we are never 100% sure. That is when Digital implant dentistry helps because the technologies in the dentalist treatment now with all the softwares we have, CBCTs, intraoral scanners, bench scanners, allow us to plan. We don't have to have a box full of components. We can plan, we can order what we need for that specific case. So that's really important when we add all these technologies to virtual treatment planning for the patient. And I like to quote this paper by uh, Alejandro Lenis, a great uh, clinician, a great prosthodontist and implant surgeon in Santiago, Chile. He, this, he uh, pu published on the three ways to look at digital planning. One is when we do single teeth or partial, is because we have enough occlusal references. We can do a completely virtual wax up. Now the second is a fully edentulous without any references. It's a partial or fully dental patients. We have to do a denture, we have to do a dual scan, and then we have to have marks to superimpose it. Last, changing references. Changing references are for those patients that will be fully edentulous. We have hopeless teeth, we have to remove the teeth, we have to do a veloplasty, then we have to put the implants in. How do we do it through a guided procedure? That's a little bit more complicated. We have to pay a lot of attention how to merge those images. So let me illustrate this with this patient that has uh, 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 changing references. It's a full arch prosthesis, four bone level tapered implants were used for the mandible. So first we do a wax up of the denture. We have the fully denture already constructed. Everything is scanned and superimposed. Really important to be precise on superimposition. We have to be able to superimpose it correctly. Segmentation and superimposition are two key points on digital implant surgery. If you don't segment the image correctly, and if you don't superimpose your STL file onto your DICOM file correctly, your whole treatment is going to be digitally wrong. And we are now seeing the next phase of complications, which is complications driving or derived from digital planning. Because everybody thinks, I know digital, it should work for everybody. It's experience. So we have to combine that digital image to then have the denture in the right place, 
to then select the kind of implants we want according to the bone, according to the bone density, according to the abutment selections that we have, according to personal preferences, tissue level, bone level, bone level, tapered, short, long. We have the whole portfolio available to us. And then we have, and on this case, we use this Troman Pro Arch tool, and then we angle the implants in the correct position in order to reduce the cantilever because anatomically the nerve was too far forward. We would reduce the cantilever by distally tilting. My first choice is always to have parallel placed implants. If you cannot have parallel implants, then we have to choose between grafting or using a an tilted implant. And then we achieved good primary stability. So by achieving good primary stability, we did a chair side pickup technique because the denture was already pre-made. And that is being done by the lab. And that case was done in Brazil. So that was the final restoration screw onto the four bone level tapering. It's a classic pro art solution. And I want to finish with this last case that was actually conducted by Dr. Lanis in Chile. And we are writing a paper. It's already accepted for publication about the use of uh, prefabricated printed models to have the denture made even before touching the patient. So first, he achieved the prosthetic setup for this patient, and then we went through the whole dual scan protocol with the digital planning. We designed this, the guide, the surgical guide, and then the guided surgery was done in the conventional way in a flapless because this patient had a lot of bone, so that made, of course, our case easier. So implants were placed in the maxilla, impressions were taken, everything was mounted on the articulator again, the denture was adjusted, and then the prosthesis was delivered 24 hours later. That is the classic pro-arch on six implants for the maxilla, not, digi not digitally printed. It was guided surgery, but all the restoration was done in the conventional way. Now, what is the difference? And this is the uh, immediate loading for the maxilla. What we added as new was the mandible. In the mandible, we did the design, we did the same implant planning, we had enough bone for loading of six implants, we designed the guide, but then we printed the mandible before even putting the implants in. So we printed the whole mandible, and then we added the, the replicas of the implants into the printed model. By having that in the correct position, that was then mounted in the articulator, and the full denture was constructed before even touching the patient. So we had the cast model, we had the prefabricated prosthesis, and we had the 3D printed model articulated. And then we had the final restoration 3D printed, ready to go before even touching the patient or doing the surgery. And then the conventional surgery was done step by step, guided surgery, all the details, correct adaptation of the guide, correct fixation of the guide, flapless, very experienced, skilled clinicians here uh, working for this case, and that was the plan. And that was the result achieved during the surgery. So we are able to actually print. We're using this technology to train in courses and nowadays to be able to position the implant in the correct uh, way. So final abutments were placed. The fixed immediate provision was delivered on the same day. In two hours, everything was done. This is a seven-day follow-up. And this is a 30-day follow-up for the fixed uh, bridge. And Alejandro just sent me yesterday the final uh, restorations with close to six months of follow-up here, and, and that's the final restoration. So, concluding, the number of implants, we just, we just finished a systematic review on the ITI consensus conference held here in Amsterdam in April, and then the clinical recommendations are written as well. When patients present with teeth in place, all efforts should be made to preserve teeth. If, they can, if it cannot be done, then we have to plan for full extractions and then plan uh, extractions, plan the space, and plan the prosthesis. The final prosthetic plan should be considered when developing a surgical plan. Prosthesis material, one piece or segmented, static factors, opposing dentition, available space, anatomy, distribution, hygiene, maintenance, patient preferences, and compliance. And that's that was on the clinical recommendation. Just it's going to it's accepted in the clinical oral implants research journal will be published in a few months. A minimum number of four implants appropriately distributed can be used. There is no statistic significant difference that four implants work less or better than six. But what we have to consider as clinicians, if we have a loss of one implant, like you can see here on this case, we lost one implant, the most distal implant, everything has to be remade. So that is one consideration that additional options, additional implants, sorry, can provide for options or more options for our patients. So we have to be aware of that consideration. 
when selecting, planning, and, and loading, systemic conditions, implant loading, need or not need for bone grafting, implant size and shape, and of course, again, experience and skill of the clinicians. All those modifiers have to be taken in consideration. How do you achieve experience and skills? You go through a learning curve, and I like to recommend that you go through the SAC concept. You have a systematic evaluation. You select your case adequately. That is the main key here, main message, case selection. Understand your level of experience. Identify the surgical and the restorative risks. If you cannot solve it by yourself, teamwork. Teamwork is really important. I like to recommend, again, knowledge, experience, technology. It all comes through learning. Go to the ITI Online Academy, and you're going to learn. It's one of the best efforts you have to learn implant dentistry. By doing that, I would like to thank, again, all of your attention. Thank everybody that helped me to put this presentation together, Dr. Morton, Dr. Wei Shaolin from the Indiana University, Luis Gonzaga, Will Martin from Florida in Gainesville, Dudu Peters and, and Rodrigo Rocha in Porto Alegre, Brazil, Professor Galucci and Adam Hammett in Harvard, Boston, and Alejandro Laniz and Professor Orlando Del Campo in Santiago, Chile. So thank you for your attention. I promise to finish relatively on time. This is our team in Porto Alegre, Brazil. This is our new team at the Indiana University School of Dentistry. Thank you again for all your attention. It was a pleasure to be here. And now, one of the reasons I want to finish on time is, you know, we have a game. So, everybody here roots for Brazil. Thank you. So, um, I have two more assignments. One assignment is to show you a little bit about the future, because I will show you some pictures now of a brand new implant that Strauman will launch next year. And the second one is to be done until 2 o'clock because of the game. Valdemar is Brazilian, if you didn't realize that. So he's on the game at 2 o'clock now. So we all cheer for either Brazil or Costa Rica. I don't, we don't know. Okay, I'll just show you some x-rays. Th this is the new implant design that Strauman will launch next year. It's called the BLX. We've now been having three diameters available. In the center, you'll see the 5.5, which was conventionally placed, conventionally loaded. On your right side, you'll see the 4.5 that we had available now in the springtime, which was immediately placed and conventionally loaded. On your left side, you'll see the implant that we had available this week, which is the 3.75 millimeter implant. A very nice diameter for implants. And that one was was immediately placed and immediately loaded. I will just look quickly into that case so you know how, why are they developing new implants. Primary stability, immediacy protocols, predictability. So the case here was an internal resorption of 222. We see on the CBCT, it's important with CBCTs to, to, to know, as, we've, as, as has been shown now, that we need to know what the position, the sagittal position of the root in the alveolus before we start doing the treatment. If you look at a classification for that, Khan and co-workers has made that classification. It's important that you know that because you don't want to go to class four because then you're, go you're going to be in deep shit when you try to do an immediate placement and an immediate loading. So you want to stay in class one to two at least, which are the most optimal ones for, for immediate placement and immediate loading. Uh, the case I'm showing now has the class one. If you look at your left side, you'll see the, the class four stuff and that's not an option to place implants in. You've already been shown that by France. This is a picture I just received from a colleague of mine this week. Somebody didn't do that treatment planning. That one was done in, in another country than Norway, luckily, uh, and there was a pain history coming into this, into this office with this patient, and it shows that somebody didn't do treatment planning. So this classification and knowing with the CBCT is important if you want to go to these protocols. You also need to know, as was told, that we need to know if there's a facial bone defect. So if there is just a small one, you can continue. If it's larger and if it's extending out, don't do those immediacy protocols. Choose your cases. So in this case, again, all favorable conditions, minimal invasive removal of the tooth, correct buccal, uh, buccal palatal uh, positioning of the implant, bone augmentation, chair side immediate, temporary crown, and predictable treatment because we know that we can have predictable stability of these implants. So this is a promising implant that's gonna come. You're gonna see more of this as we move into 2019. So that one is in. 
we're ready for the game, everything should be okay. The VLX has everything, it has to rock solid, it has the VLX design, which is with larger threads, basically. It has the SL active surface, and we're now working on low substitution rate biomaterials that could keep the bone or the buckle surface and the bone and keep good aesthetics. By that, I thank you and I wish you all a continuing great Friday and a good weekend. Thank you. Oh, you want that one? session today and I would like to thank everybody here in the room and online for your kind attention of spending the time with us this afternoon and I would like to thank our speakers Dr. Eric Salves and Franz Lambert and Valdemar Podido for their very insightful lectures today. Before you leave make sure please to give us your feedback at the exit of the hall and with that I thank you again and Valdemar you make it just on time for the match. Thank you. <laughs>